Blair, thank you so much for coming on my podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. And it's great to finally meet you in person. You look incredible. Can you please talk us through your outfit? I need people oh, to experience absolutely. this. So yes, for the audio visual. So <laughs> um, I have a glorious little sun-kissed glow from Greece. Bless up. But acne mm-hmm. because I refuse to stop eating cheese. Um, <laughs> I'm also wearing my own lipstick collection from Fem Power Beauty called Ubuntu. And the lipsticks are all quite deep because... I am. And this color represents um, mutual respect. Uh, And it's also kind of cool because my friends who are the founders of it, they're a lesbian couple. They just got married. I officiated their wedding. And I learned that their heritage, like their ancestors, invented purple dye. So the lip I'm wearing is purple. So I feel like very oh. like I'm a historian too so I feel so like, like I'm yeah, on it ev- yeah. everything you're doing is intentional with <laughs> yeah. the outfit today also lesbian lipstick exactly I love <laughs> um, and then I'm wearing a pink hijab uh, which is quite comfy and it's from a British brand called uh, Pixie Plum uh, highly recommend and then hashtag not sponsored um, <laughs> and then I'm wearing a little caftan which is just this fun kind of jewel tone print Silky. with yellow and orange and white and purple um, and I'm going to be wearing it all day so it's it going looks- to get sweaty unless I hop over to Boots and get some deodorant so I'll do that after the podcast it looks incredible <laughs> you're just you're, you're such a vision you're just blending into the room and just, I actually had to take a picture of Blair before the episode started so uh, yeah I just needed people to hear what you're wearing um, so before we get into everything I want to ask you today I'm going to go through my flosses quick fire five questions just say the first thing that comes to your mind we'll try and get through these quickly and I'll try not to ask you more questions about your answers um, question one what is one thing that sets your soul on fire Uh, historical inaccuracy like in a bad way where I want to like fight (laughs) historical inaccuracy yeah okay like I can't walk through a museum unless uh and like I know we're supposed these are supposed to be rapid fire but like if I walk through a museum and I see something like blatantly like heteronormative in a way that it's not meant to be Mm. or like something that just makes zero sense like I was in the archaeological museum in uh Heraklion in in, uh, Crete and they were saying that uh, clearly, whatever like white British man un- excavated the stuff was like, why are there zero white men depicted? I know. I know it's the case. All <laughs> of the dark figures are not dark skinned women. They're men. Okay. And so it's just like stuff like that where I'm just like, what the heck? And okay. I feel the need to like go on a little bit of a rant. Mm-hmm. So I did a little video on that on my stories. But yeah, historical inaccuracy pisses me off. <laughs> That's fucking fascinating. And I can't wait to ask you more about this. I have so many questions about how you even got into history, why it's such a soul on fire. Um, I'm, I'm going to get into that in the main interview. That was an amazing answer. Question number two. What's the last photo you took? What was it a picture of? Uh, I mean, let me just be honest right now. I'll look at my phone. <laughs> Let's see. And then lie if it was a new... Just kidding. Um, <laughs> it's a picture of me putting on this lipstick on the tube. <laughs> okay, question number three. What's something that people frequently misunderstand or get wrong about you? Oh, people think I'm so serious, partially because mm. as we were talking, yeah. my, my main headshot is me like with my arms crossed. Yes. And I was like, women yeah. don't need to smile, so I'm not going to smile. But my personality <laughs> is just like a constant smile yes. so people think I'm quite serious so I've started to have like tell more jokes and stuff because yeah. when people meet me they're like you're so fun and I'm like I come off as quite severe online I I find that interesting because I don't see you as quite a severe person I see you as someone who cares about things it's very informed but at the heart of absolutely everything you do you're so fucking joyful Thank Like when you. I think of Blair I think of Blair smiling okay next question finish the sentence I'm still a work in progress when it comes to Quite frankly, everything, but I guess to be specific, my relationship with food, I'm working Mm. on that. You know, again, growing up in L.A., diet culture is everywhere. And I had to get over this feeling of like guilt every time it was time to be hungry. Mm. Like, no, like, thank you, body, for letting me know that it's time to eat. Thank you for taking care of me instead of like shame on you for existing and being alive, you Mm -hmm. know. I want to get into talking about being bisexual. I fucking love being bisexual. Do you love being bisexual? I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love being bisexual. Um, can't stand the bi-erasure though. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's frustrating. Yeah. So um, let's talk about bi and your experience of it. Um, do you talk about this in your work a lot, bi So I don't really talk about it a lot. I mean, I kind of just say like, you know, I'm queer and I leave it at that. And I think for such a long time in my career, like when I was first becoming a public figure, mm-hmm. people didn't know I was queer. I think that after I did come out, 
there was this expectation that you're not really bisexual unless you're either single or in a relationship with a woman or somebody mm-hmm. who's non-binary and feminine. Because of bi erasure and because of homophobia and sexism and all these things, women are defined by our relationships mm-hmm. and then our identities become conflated with that. And then we're expected to justify our bisexuality by disclosing our like, you know, sexual uh, partners. Our sexual history. past. Yes. yes, our sexual yes. history. Yes. And it's it's all quite uh, unnecessary. Mm-hmm. And I think I even struggle with it. You know, like outwardly, I try to project like this very like confident image of being like a bisexual who understands her bisexuality and all mm-hmm. these things. And, you know, first coming out as a lesbian and then determining, oh, wow, bisexuality is a thing and really feeling confident in that. But there is kind of this creeping inner by panic of like yes. but what if I'm just a really bad yes. lesbian but it's, what if this you know it's like queer imposter syndrome isn't oh it? completely how do you feel about the word lesbian because I feel like so many queer people have different relationships with it some people grow up to think that it was a dirty word I know people have only just like felt comfortable using it was that ever a word that you were taught was dirty oh ever? no okay well so first of all my parents are hippies like okay. they're just straight up very yeah. <laughs> affirming like my mom is so sex positive that I really feel like the part of the reason why I dress so modestly is because my mom was so body positive wow. <laughs> like, okay, okay. you know like I had that the other way. this is me rebelling okay. you know? and even to <laughs> most people you know with that said like I've always thought that lesbian was such a pretty word like to mm. me bisexual I was confused about because the word sexual is in it and then you would think it has to do directly with your sexual history History. But shout yes. out to GLAAD in 2007, I want to say, where mm-hmm. my mom and I looked up what it meant. And it was about how you don't have to have any or equal experiences with whatever genders to be mm-hmm. bisexual. And it's not something like, I think because bisexuality is so delegitimized versus, you know, queerness or being a lesbian or being gay, that you know, not to erase those struggles, but to feel like it doesn't even exist. Mm-hmm. So that way, when you're like kind of out in the world and you're finding yourself like, passionately like drawn to somebody regardless of their gender which for many folks aligns more with pansexuality but I use them interchangeably me too I'm the same yeah Yeah, yeah. and so I think oh there's just such a mess and then you have the people who think that bisexuality (laughs) means that you agree with a binary or that there's transphobia and like yeah yeah, that can be the case in anything because we are Mm. all socialized in these systems of harm to the point where we have folks it doesn't matter who you are you can still perpetuate oppression right Mm. and so the expectation that one group of people whether that be Muslims or bisexuals are specifically hateful it just adds another layer of something you have to break through in addition to understanding yourself. So mm. it's quite a headache. So what what do you think about the word queer? And can you talk a little bit about the history of the word queer? Absolutely. Ask me to talk about history. Wow, straight to <laughs> Yes, please, go off, go. So queer is interesting. And so is the word straight, quite frankly, because mm. they became part of the lexicon right around the same time where, you know, queer and gay kind of meant like happy. And then you have queer starting to mean odd. And you see this really start up in the end of World War One into World War Two. Straight at the same time meant on the right path, not deviating, Mm -hmm. correct. And then we have queer meaning a little bit off, deviating, and, you know, not the proper way. And so both of those things, like queer becomes peculiar and straight becomes on the, you know, straight and narrow. Like we see it all the time. And so they become dichotomous terms used to describe people that are doing society correctly, you know, 1.5 children, all that. And then queer people who are messing with the status quo. And there's this current moment happening in the states and i think uh, definitely here as well where people are like no people who are being themselves are disrupting the social order and it's like well maybe if the social order is repressive it needs to be disrupted yes yes you know yes yes Um, yes and so but then as we get into the 1980s as we see the rise of the hiv aids crisis um queer starts to be used as like an accusation and we see this We've seen this throughout the past hundred years, but queer becomes an accusation. It becomes a verbal attack. It becomes these words that you don't want to be. Okay. And there are so many words that, you know, we have the the F word that mm-hmm. people used to say cigarettes in the UK. We don't For gay do men. Yeah, yeah, we don't use that in the States. Um, and there's just so many different words. Anything that, and it all has to do with you and really being used against gay men to violate your performance of masculinity. And then Mm. the words that we see used against women are terms that are used to describe that you're not performing femininity in the proper way. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So those words are used to say that you're not performing by... Oh, that's completely what it is. It's like, because, you know, you could be called queer, you could be called all these words 
regardless of your actual sexual orientation, true, because true. it's an assumption, you know? Yeah. That's why all these policies around uh, dress codes and haircuts and everything aren't specific, aren't just to attack non-binary and trans people. It's to attack everyone, like wh- whomever is just existing. It's to dictate who you are and how you're behaving and how you're violating cis normativity or heteronormativity. You grew up Christian. Yeah. And then you decided to participate for Islam. And so you're Muslim and bisexual. You did a whole TED talk on being Muslim and bisexual. Um, and it was fucking amazing, by the oh, way. Thank you. And so inspiring. And yeah, I wanted to talk about that. It was a story that I felt like I needed to tell. Maybe not the first one that came off the top of my head, because when it comes to being yourself, it feels quite like bland and just regular and casual. But to you other mean, people... Do you mean to say... Bit to, to, do you mean to tell people be yourself? Would you mean yeah. to actually just be yourself? It's just to fun. be yourself. It's okay. so mundane, you know. Like when somebody has a super cool job, but they do it every day, it's yes. like they're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know, I build rockets mm-hmm. out of whatever, and it's and you're just like, wow. But to them, they do it every day, so it's whatever. But it was really just a story of myself, and there are so many beautiful TED talks that just talk about who you are and how it can be educational because. There are so many ways we're told we can't be ourselves. And so when we see somebody who just is being themselves and telling that story and for me trying to add some jokes to it. But what I love at the end is when if you're able to talk to the people afterward, because Mm -hmm. everyone has a different perspective Mm -hmm. about the speech that just took place. Some people will come and be like, I loved this part. And you're like, what do you even mean? I think you do this on your Instagram really well, though, bringing in your audience with your reels, uh, smarter in seconds. Can you talk a bit more about that? Because it's just amazing. And the way you've been able to curate all of your content while still making it incredibly impactful and so easy to understand. I don't think anyone would feel excluded from your content. And I don't mean like per video and that it's your responsibility to cover every topic. I just mean in terms of its accessibility. It's so, um, everything you could want is laid out in this short video. I just think it's a big skill to have. Thank you so much. I think that it comes a little bit from... Really, it comes from like a lot of coping mechanisms that I had growing up to get quite deep immediately. Like, yeah. first, thank you so much for the affirmations. Um, growing up, I was the only like we we're the only black family in the neighborhood. And so my parents, again, Los Angeles, very celebrity, very image obsessed town. And I had this experience of we're not going to school unless your hair is perfect. Why? Because you're a representative for the entire Black community. You're the only Black person that these kids in your class and at school are going to see, Mm. and you have to put your best foot forward. It was quite a respectability politic. And I honestly feel like after um, Barack Obama became president, it eased up a little bit. Could you explain, sorry, what respectability politics means? absolutely. Smarter in seconds. (laughs) (laughs) So respectability politics describes this sociological phenomenon or this you know, phenomenon that happens within societies where people feel as though if you present yourself as respectable, and it's not just respectable, it's how the dominant society views you as respectable. So if the dominant society is white supremacy, then you're trying to appear as close in proximity to whiteness as possible. Mm. This can mean straightening your hair. This can mean, you know, long hair for people who are assigned women, you know, like short hair for men and then beards and, but not too bushy of a beard. Like it's all these very specific things, a suit, but a tailored suit. But it really changes with the times. It has to do with body. It has to do with ableism. It has to do with Mm. so many different things. Um, And so when we have respectability politics, that's when we have different marginalized groups policing how people should present, behave, um, conduct themselves uh, in alignment with that dominant group. And so at my house, it basically became my family trying to fight racism through policing how their black children behaved outside of the home okay. and how they looked outside of the home. And so in it's accordance like, to the quote unquote values of beauty that you were just describing. Exactly. Okay. Or like just really kind of perfection. And it becomes this very toxic thing. I don't think that it uh, kind of you could say it, di- it dived into like a little bit of toxicity. But I think that it was what my parents knew best to do. It wasn't mm. my parents trying to be like evil or harmful to us. It was like this Survival, will make school right? a little bit. Yeah. survival. Um, It gets frustrating, though, because sometimes uh, analysis of respectability politics will ignore the systems of oppression that cause it and just go after the people themselves and say, well, why why don't you just liberate yourself? And it's like, oh, I'd love to just liberate myself from capitalism, but rent has to, you know, rent has to be paid. So how do we do this in a different way? But um, so I grew up with that. It was like a 101 on PR because I'm constantly thinking about how I'm looking to all of the people around me, you know, and it really became 
been quite intense to, you know, me feeling like I had to study up on uh, when uh, President Barack Obama was Senator Barack Obama. And I would have parents coming to, you know, pick up their kids from school, hop out of the car and come up to ask me, the only black person they were going to see that day, what I thought about. And I and instead of just being like, I'm a kid, I don't know. I was like, oh, yes, my wow. calling in life. Let me answer. And it became quite intense. And I really rose to the occasion. And then it became how I tried to navigate life. Like, how do I counteract all of the ways that my physical being could make someone, quote unquote, uncomfortable and use charm and charisma and humor and, you know, little facts to make people like me. <laughs> and wow. yeah, that's kind of how I got to where I am. And that's what you're doing today. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But the better yeah. the better thing is that I'm not doing it today because I feel pressured to like it's genuinely part of my personality yeah. now like I'll talk to people who are like you know but you don't have to be so palatable and I'm like I kind of don't know how not to be and it's not so much palatability in the sense that I'm trying to like be non-controversial I love to be mm. controversial I want to make sure that people are hearing me and seeing me and receiving me as much as I can extend myself mm -hmm. I'm not trying to reach to like the far right and be like hey look at Black people are humans. Like, I'm not yeah, there. I'm like, no. okay, well, for the folks who are kind of like, why are people mad about the 4th of July? How mm. can I explain the duplicity of Thomas Jefferson saying all men are created equal and then enslaving 600 people in the course of his lifetime? Mm. I think it's one thing to do this privately. Even as a child, I can't imagine the responsibility of that on you. Like you said, it taught you how to be uh, want to understand PR and even just public image and stuff like that. That's a lot of responsibility to have privately. What made you want to do this publicly? It wasn't until it had happened where I was like, oh, wow, look at all these little points in life that built me up for this moment. Yeah. Like my first job, um, like my first like big girl job out of university was working at Planned Parenthood. And part of that job was taking like a uh, really dense educational material and like research on bodily autonomy and reproductive health and abortion and then turning that into something that we could use in the deep south to talk to different religious figures. Okay. So I was already kind of primed to train folks on how to talk about really tough things in ways that didn't endanger them or make other people feel vulnerable or like they should shut themselves down. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's something that people always ask me is what was the moment like I said there was some kind of like click moment where I was like Do you know what I'm going to talk about feminism and it like you're right it was a slowly progressing it feels so natural and I feel like what's really hard is to explain and give tips to, to people about something that comes so intuitively to me so it like you said about being yourself it's actually quite banal and boring or every day to you and then when people ask you you're like actually I don't know this is just the way I am and there are a series of things that can lead to that but ultimately it comes intuitively and you're just kind of doing the next thing onto the next thing and then when you look back though it's exciting well at least for me where I'm like oh no this connected to that like the first award I had gotten ever mm -hmm. as a kid was for public speaking in like wow. fifth grade so it kind of like oh snap and I yes. do that for a living now so like it mm -hmm. kind of matches up but I speak a lot at like um secondary schools and so whenever the one of the students asks how do I become an influencer and all the teachers are like no don't tell the kids to become influencers yeah I always remind them that like this job didn't exist when I was your age or, or when you're doing school toward a career sometimes mm. that's a very practical thing but you also want to do like what is something you can do effortlessly that you're passionate about that you want to learn more about that you could do every single day oh, yes. and then find a way to make your interests and your talents match in a revenue stream and mm. influencing is a great way to do that but there's a world where I'm not doing that. You yeah, know? I, I view I view uh, my social media platforms almost as a springboard to put my message out there, to share my art, to share my writing. I actually took a really strange path. I, I went to fashion school and look what I'm doing now. But it got me out of Plymouth where I was living and into London, which is exactly where I needed to be to meet queer people and to open my eyes to who I could be if I let go of all of these old versions of myself. And that allowed me to be myself and make better art. And then that started the path. There's no like real limit in your way to get to where you want to be and I think that abandoning those old views of like you said a direct path to education to getting a degree in what you want to do um it just doesn't apply to everyone anymore oh no I mean there's a world where I'm a lawyer and I'm miserable Damn. I was in law school and it was like week seven and I saw on the calendar <laughs> last date for tuition and I was like I'm not doing this I can't do this anymore yeah <laughs> so I like I actually went to um Bus Boys and Poets with my friend Mariah which is like this little coffee shop and Angela Davis was giving a speech uh with wow. Erica Totten um and it was like a moment I love Angela Davis so much like I think she was one of the few people that I felt like I like representationally like looked like uh -huh. and couldn't see myself in and when I went to go see her speak I like 
wait until the Q&A, crawled to the front and grabbed the mic from the MC. Like I pulled it down from the wire and I was like, and I basically asked, like, should I drop out of law school? And, um, you know, from what I remember from that, like, mind blowing moment was basically that I don't need an institution to create change. Yeah. And that if I'm asking the question that I probably already know the answer. Mm. And so I dropped out of law school and my mom was like, called it because my mom knew I didn't what want to be a lawyer. What did Angela Davis say? Oh, that's what she said was that I don't oh. need an institution. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, I realized. And I was like, wait, what did oh, she no, say? No, no. That's what she told okay. me. She's like, that I don't need an institution <laughs> to create change. And that like, you know, basically like if you're asking this question. <laughs> you were polling a big life choice and I did the same thing. Put on my Instagram, should I drop out of uni? 96% of people said no. And I did. I did drop out. Well, thank goodness I had Angel Davis to say, yeah, yeah you should. Yeah, and then yeah. also my mom, who said I should. My mom was like, why are you going to law school? This is not for you. Oh, okay. And I was like, because Legally Blonde is a very impressionable movie on me. Um, <laughs> my third year of, of law school when I would have graduated was when my first book came out. And so mm-hmm. that could have been my, you know, like I could have been a totally different trajectory. And I'm sure I could have helped people in that way, but I was miserable in law school. So if you're yeah. miserable where you are, like, are you going to keep on that path or are you going to start planning? <laughs> This is the thing I really want to talk about is that you're such a joyful person and a lot of people think that joy and activism can't go hand in hand. A lot of people think that misery is required. (laughs) Yes, they do. And a a movement cannot move if everyone's upset and and miserable and almost bathing in this kind of um, cycle of, of bad news. But I understand why people think they go hand in hand because the reality of the stuff that we're talking about with social justice is heavy and depressing. But I also think the state sponsors a lot of media that and like, you know, moves forward a lot of media that causes people to think that if you choose a life of being radically involved in other people's lives in the betterment of society, then you're not going to be happy. You're better doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Because how else would we have a society like, you know, everybody would be chaining themselves to oil tankers, like I was saying. Exactly. Um, I think that joy is necessary so that you can fill other people up. I wouldn't be able to do the things I do if I wasn't so enthusiastic about them. I think that your joy sparks other joy in other people as well. So how do you... um, how do you stay joyful in this work? Well, um, you know, it really reminds me of Audre Lorde and like her conceptualization of self-care and all of this, like mm. that, you know, joy being a revolutionary act and like you have to pour into yourself and that self-care is community care. Um, for me, it can be quite chemical. You know, I'm on antidepressants. I'm on, you know, uh, attention medication. I have to take care of like my mental health first. Mm-hmm. I've been medicated for quite a long time and it works really well. Um, even though that I'm on medication for anxiety, I still have to like meditate and take care of myself. Mm-hmm. Meditation doesn't work for everybody, but I think that like having a mechanism, whether it's through my faith practice or my yoga practice, where I can just like unplug, especially when I'm so online, can be really helpful. But I also love to be online. Like I Mm. feel joyful. Like I I asked yesterday, I was like, um, what's the way that you're becoming your own beauty standard? And the responses I got, like people telling me that they've gone through chemo and they're working on like, you know, affirming their womanhood. I love that question. Oh, yeah. Like because it's it's so deep, right? Like it's so intense. How are you becoming your own beauty standard? I love that. And the responses were just like, wow, like this this one woman reached out and she was like, well, not only am I realizing that I'm still a woman and valid having had a double mastectomy and chemo, but I'm also recognizing how as a cisgender woman, this expectation of womanhood is harming me too. And so if it's harming me, how, how like it must be harming like trans folks so much more. And like just people just come in my DMs with like revelations of their lives. And yes. I'm like, that's what fuels me. So you spoke then about leaning into your faith to keep you grounded um, and joyful in this work. How did you convert to Islam? So I converted to Islam in 2015 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I, I, I so I spent a lot of time doing a lot of different like religious practices trying to find myself. Uh-huh. I grew up Christian, but I think after there was kind of like this moment of embezzlement at one of the churches that we were going to, I kind of had like a, I, I had a disillusionment there. Of course, that duplicity exist in all, you know, religious, you know, establishments Mm -hmm. and non-religious establishments, quite frankly. Um, But at the moment, I was looking for a grass is greener on the other side situation. Um, When I started going to mosque, it was like just this beautiful experience where I felt so welcomed. I've said this before, like when I come, when I came through the doors of the mosque, it felt like I had come in out of a storm. And it was just like this place of calm and relief. Um, It was gender segregated as a lot of mosques were. And at first I was like, this is very sexist. And yeah, a lot of the roots of that can 
can be quite patriarchal, but it was simultaneously the first time I was in like a space with other diverse women yeah. where of like different age where we were just talking and just being amongst ourselves. And it wasn't like a... It was like a modest space where it wasn't like competitive. I can't remember the last, I don't think I've ever, actually ever experienced that. Yeah. And it's quite beautiful. With, like with strangers, initially strangers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, complete strangers. Yeah. So there were people who were there like just on vacation. It was one of the first times where I didn't feel like I had to justify myself and I just could be. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not everybody's experience going to the mosque first time, but it, well, it was mine. And it made me question, why have I been so afraid to open the Quran? Why have I been so afraid to learn about this culture? Mm-hmm. And it's also ironic because my mom, who is so liberal, like I said, very body positive. The only one thing that she would always like comment on was if we were at a theme park and she saw uh, a Muslim woman in a hijab, she would like lament out loud, like, oh, that poor woman. And she had this very kind of like Western mm-hmm. mindset of all Muslim women are being Oppressed. And it's like, well, all women are being rep- oppressed, honey, if you really yeah, want to talk yeah, about yeah. it. Um, and so when I I kind of had that subconsciously, as a lot of people do, mm-hmm. like sometimes your parents make biased statements and it affects the way you operate in the world. Yeah. And then I was like, mm, that's really like, you know, negatively colored this entire religion. And so as I started reading the Quran, yeah. I never saw something that said, if gay, stop here. Or, yes. you know, if you're yeah. a woman, stop here. I was just so like, where, where, yeah. where does that come from then, that assumption? Oh, about- it comes from colonization. Uh, and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is constantly weaponized about same gender loving relationships mm-hmm. and just people who are queer in general. And the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is essentially, and then I'm going to use he, him pronouns for God, but I believe that God is beyond gender and that gender is a human construct, but for brevity. Um, God sees a sinful town where there's like pillaging and sexual violence and just mayhem New Orleans during Mardi Gras. <laughs> and, um, he's like, okay, no, I'm shutting this down. And really what sets God off is that uh, he sends these angels down. And uh, during the course of this, there's a mob. And the mob mm-hmm. is like, bring us these angels out so that basically we can attack them sexually. Okay. And then uh, Lot sends out, he takes his two daughters who are virgins and says, hey, no, don't take these strangers. Take my daughters. And then that story gets turned into, well, it was because they were trying to do gay sex on the on the angels that it's a problem. Instead of perhaps that sexual violence, like dis, you know, disowning and setting up your children for sexual violence being mm-hmm. wrong, that sexual violence is a matter of, you know, war is wrong. Yeah. And all these things just get turned into gay sex is bad. And that's so mind blowing to me. Yeah. And then you have the end of the story where they're fleeing the city and the the daughters get out safely and the angels get out safely. And then um, they're like, turn your your back on those wicked ways. And then Lot's wife looks back and she gets turned into a pillar of salt. And so that's like, you know, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. OK, the way that it gets told is oops, like so flagrantly patriarchal and protective of rape culture. Mm. Because if you can take that story and also know that in human psychology, if somebody is being attacked um, or, you know, experiencing sexual violence from a young age, that has effects on the on the psyche. What doesn't have effects, effects on the psyche or on a way that person conducts themselves is being gay. Yeah. That's totally fine. What we have a problem with is when people tell somebody that they can't be gay because of this totally misinterpreted thing. So who was gay in this story? Uh, literally nobody, but okay. the the fact that the mob, well, potentially everybody, but anyway, yeah. the fact that the mob wanted to sodomize, thus the word Sodom and Gomorrah, yes, okay. the angels. But we also know that throughout human history, there's been this trend of using sexual violence in war and in conflict to exert patriarchal dominance, to exert rape culture. And it makes a lot more sense to me that instead of this one story being the case where God is like, hey, I, I don't like gay people, gay people suck. It makes a lot more sense that God is like, hey, sexual violence, not allowed. Yeah. Consent violations, not allowed. I will destroy an entire town over somebody committing rape culture. Okay. That makes more sense to me. Yes. And with the historical record. But you have a whole bunch of other people and so many institutions that have said the inverse. And then um, Matt Bernstein, who you also know, yeah, yeah. did a uh, did a story talking about how the word homosexuality wasn't even added into the Bible, the Quran, the Torah until, you know, this period of colonization, Victorian colonizations. Instead of having this quite sensible story of God condemning sexual violence, it's a story of a very warped and twisting interpretation of uh same same gender relationships being wrong. But Islam makes a lot of sense to me. It's very much in line with like historical, you know, the historical tradition. Of course, there's some patriarchal shenanigans in there because nothing is pure. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
that's really where it comes from. And so I know my stuff. I will yeah. also simultaneously, like when somebody comes to me and they're like, Blair, why should I support LGBTQ plus people? I'm not going to give them the reason. I'm just like, why is your default to treat people horribly? Yeah. Let's talk about that first. Why yeah. do you need a justification to treat people like humans in, instead of maybe like taking a step back and asking yourself if you're going to use a misinterpreted ancient text to be horrible? <laughs> You touched on how your mum used to say, oh, those poor women who cover themselves up. I reckon a lot of people listening to the podcast might also yeah. have that point of view. Is there anything you'd like to say about that? Because well, obviously so we're so pro um, pro choice and pro uh, women doing what they want with their bodies, except for that little bit. It's like people seem can't seem to get their heads around that it's a, still a feminist choice. Well, I was at a dinner recently and I was sitting next to this very nice gentleman and he was like, so why are you why are you hiding your hair? And I was like, well, I think hiding implies that I have something to be ashamed of or whatever. But I just basically broke it down. Mm. And I was talking about, how, like, how my life is so public. And as being a woman, there's this expectation that your entire body, like, you are, people are entitled to you and your body and your mm. space. And so that's a way for me to reclaim my body. But it's also helped me through being a survivor of sexual violence and being able to reclaim my body in that way and decide, like, very deliberately what I want to show and what I don't. But I've lived all the lives, you know, like... Um, I found my old, like, uh, my old iPhone with all my old pictures in it. And, like, mm. I had this super cute outfit for um, Halloween where I was, like, a sexy teddy bear. Yeah. Where I had, like, a corset that I had done with, like, um, basically, I, like, ripped open a teddy bear. And I made the teddy bear for the corset. Uh -huh. And I had, like, a little cute skirt. Yeah, And yeah. I also used to make, like, anime-themed lingerie mm -hmm. in high school. So, like, Gorgeous. I have lived all You've the lives. You've lived all the lives. Yeah. yeah. And it's, like... There's this I, assumption that someone is doing it to you, isn't yeah. there? That, that's oh, what, completely. I yeah. mean, my grandparents, the first time that they saw me and Akeem after I started wearing hijab, we were for Mother's Day or Easter or something, and they just sat right across from him at the table scowling. And at a certain point, Akeem goes, babe, can you tell them that I'm not the one making you wear that? And I was like, <laughs> okay. But the thing is, if that was the case, is scowling at my partner the solution? That's yeah. not a bystander intervention mechanism at all. Like, Throwing shade, like if you genuinely believe that somebody is in danger of mm. having their bodily autonomy denied and taken away, sneering at them on the tube is not the solution. If yeah. you want to take bystander intervention trainings, there are so many institutions that do that. And it means fighting all types of things. It means fighting the fact that we can't just, you know, go on a run at 2 a.m. if we want to in Hampstead Heat. Look at me naming yes. British places. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's actually one of my favorite places as oh, well. It's yeah. Yeah. But the fact that we can't just have free reign, like it's all interconnected. But I find that people don't actually care. They're just trying to throw their own their own shade, their own expectations. And I see the same thing being a gay Muslim. People will tell me, like, you know, having talked about Hajj, people will say, well, how are you going to go to Saudi Arabia if you're gay? And I'm like, do you actually care about Saudi Arabia's treatment of queer people or are you trying to hurt my feelings? Yeah. Because if so, that's on you. Yeah. That's so true. I always, I always think the same of when, um, that same that same argument of when men bring up male sexual violence, when a woman is speaking about how bad the statistics, the statistics are for women, they'll be like, but what about men who get raped? What, and it's what like, well, I didn't say anything that erased that. No, no. And if you feel like you need to bring up something to delegitimize what I'm talking about, yeah. you don't care about any of this. You don't. And I see that so often, particularly when we talk about, um, in Black Lives Matter, this discussion of what about black on black crime? What about, you know, let's talk about gun crime. And I think that you see that in the in the UK as well, like, well, there's knife crime, but it's only happening amongst this group. Yes. And yeah. it's like, well, you don't actually care about violence if you're only right. using a statistic to shut down another argument. Okay, so Blair, now I'm going to move on to my listener questions. These are some things that my audience have asked you. Can you give me a hand? Let's do it. Okay. I would love to hear about mentions of queerness in the Quran. So this is the interesting thing. My friend, J. Mace III, who has a book called uh, The Black Trans Prayer Book, which is absolutely incredible and definitely follow them, um, talks about how um, when God talks about the sunrise and the sunset, people aren't running in the streets talking about where is dawn and dusk? Hmm. And so I think in that way, it's important to remember that for a lot of the Abrahamic religions and a lot of religions generally, ancient ones especially, Queerness wasn't conceptualized in the same way. Gender wasn't conceptualized in the same way. And so I think that there have been places where it's inserted, um, but those ways are generally malicious. I think it's important to not read any religious text with the expectation that everybody was what we understand today to be cisgender and straight. Mm -hmm. You know, like 
you know, like a lot of folks were very polyamorous, as we've seen. Yeah, you know? yeah, like, yeah, so yeah. why are we reading those things into it? So I think that's like kind of my answer there. But then there are some hadiths, which are not part. They're like, you know, kind of like proverbs uh, in, in Christianity, kind of like stories that didn't make it into the Quran, but that were like uh, close people to the Prophet Muhammad talked about. And one of those is about um, gender queer folks who were allowed to go to the women's areas and to the men's areas. Mm-hmm. And there's one story where uh, this a gender queer person was being condemned by Muhammad. Um, and that's seen as a condemnation of gender queer people. But what it actually is, is a condemnation of disloyalty and gossip. Because what the problem was, is that they were going to the women's areas, getting dirt from the women and then telling the men. Okay. And so instead of it being that act it becomes that person that's condemned. Okay. So clearly folks were there. Um, but I think that we've had just such a colonial history since that time that the Quran was written um, that have made it a thing where people have to declare their queerness. And that wasn't so much the case before that time period, you know, like people just were. Before colonization. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Amazing answer. Thank you so much. So one of the other questions here. What should I do if no one in my church will accept my sexuality? It depends, right? Like, I think my gut reaction is tell you to go to a different church. But what if you're somebody who lives with your family, you aren't out or like, you know, you don't have another church where you are. I think that that's quite presumptuous for me to just say go somewhere else. Yeah, sure. Um, I would say that in Islam, and I've talked about this myself, um, and I think in a lot of monotheistic religions, we don't believe that other human beings are responsible for deciding our eternal fate that that's God's duty and that it's also inappropriate for human beings to Mm. declare themselves as God. So when somebody tells me you're going to hell, I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that God used Instagram. You know, know? (laughs) and then also if you think that God is all powerful, all knowing, all present, why does God need you to tell me these things, yeah. right? Like, won't I feel it in my life? Like, what I'm feeling is God loving me, God affirming me, God uplifting me, opening yeah. doors for me, passing things through to me, like me being mm-hmm. a vessel for these stories. So why do you feel the need to appoint yourself and anoint yourself to come to me and tell me that I'm not, you know, going to heaven yeah. when you're not even supposed to be God in the first place? Yeah. So I think that's one of the things, how to, like, protect your soul, to know that it's not your fault. So affirming for yourself, yeah. even if people are saying these things. Oh, yeah, just yeah. to affirm yourself because... Um, just like with coming out, like some people feel like they must come out. And I'm like, yeah, if you want to, that's on, you know, that's fine. And in society, we're definitely told that we have to. But remember to come out to yourself first and to, you know, deal with your own heart Mm. first and your own identity first, because that's something only you can give to you. And that's something that nobody else can take away. Yeah. Okay. Amazing answer. Thank you so much. So the next one here, when did the acronym LGBTQ come about? I only learned about bisexuality in 2014. Oh, amazing. Well, I only learned about it in 2007. And, you know, the thing is, none of us knew that a fork was called a fork until we learned that it was called a fork. Yeah. Same thing with spoons yeah. and knives and everything else, you know. Um, and so never be ashamed of not knowing something before you knew it, because that's a headache. You know, like yeah. there's so many things we don't know. Are we going to be ashamed that we don't know it? That's a waste of time when we can yeah. just be learning. Yeah, the information just literally did not cross your path until that moment. It's out of your control. <laughs> Intentionally, because isn't there like a section in the UK curriculum where you can't talk about being queer? And then that's a thing in the States as well. So as far as that, uh, so the LGBTQ acronym, LGBTQ+, plus, is quite recent, I would say, in the past 10 years. Um, LGBT, so it kind of goes, so it was the the homophile movement, so same gen, same love, you know, same gender loving, and then it became um, the gay movement, and then the gay and lesbian movement, and then it was quite a long time before bisexuals were included in that. It was never the acronym LGB, um, and, you know, fuck you to the LGB alliance just because, and then... Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, um, even though we have trans folks who created this movement, who were really responsible, folks like Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, for shifting the movement from being like, hey, we're just like you, except we're gay, yeah. to being actually no and screw these laws around us not being able to assemble peacefully. Screw these laws about us not being able to be who we are. You know, like, uh, let's fight police brutality. Let's fight v- police violence. That shift, that radical shift in the movement, happened because of gender nonconforming and gender queer people, and also bisexuals like Stormy. Um, and so, all these people coming together. It really wasn't, I think, until the '90s that we see the acronym LGBT, and then later on in the early 2000s and late 2000s, LGBT. Q for queer Mm -hmm. slash questioning and then including I for intersex uh, folks who are also impacted by all these systems and then A for agender asexual but I also think that some folks think that A stands for allies and if that's you know for me I was like you know I'm just here because it's for allies (laughs) but it's actually because I'm very gay yes yes (laughs) yes 
wow, I've just taken in so much information about the queer community that I had no idea about, and um, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah as well. I, the only time I've ever heard those two words together was in a Peach song. Um, so I'm glad to have the correct context of it now. Um, I think Blair is so interesting and that big fucking brain of hers just contains all of this knowledge. And I really hope that this was enlightening for you to listen to as well. I'm definitely gonna be thinking about this conversation for a while. Thank you so much to Blair again for joining me today and to all of you for listening. You can find Blair Imani on Instagram with the handle at Blair Imani, that's B-L-A-I-R-I-M-A-N-I.